Great. OK, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about a topic that's uh, near and dear to my heart, which is uh, uh, I'm originally trained as a physicist. I've been doing a lot on the machine learning side recently. And a lot of that has been kind of in the context of trying to uh, uh, figure out how to uh, you know, use what we know, which is oftentimes encoded in some sort of physical simulator. And in, in doing these various projects over the last couple of years, there's just, uh, you know, several different ob observations and things. So I'm going to try to sort of go through that. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty high level talk. There is a, there's some notion of it being a tutorial, which is mainly just to try to point out the different sets of con considerations uh, and things that uh, I think are important to have in the back of your mind. Um, I'm also going to be, uh, I'm one of the organizers for the workshop on interpretable machine learning, so I'll try to say a few things that are kind of in that direction. Um, so I'd like to just yeah thank uh, support from uh, both uh, the National Science Foundation and also the Moore and Sloan Foundations uh, started a, a project that was the, called the Moore Sloan Data Science Environments at uh, Berkeley, NYU, and University of Washington, and that uh, spurred a lot of uh, interdisciplinary work, especially between domain scientists and and uh, data scientists and computer scientists and mathematicians and etc. Um, oh, and then uh, just a list of various collaborators that I've been working with in the last. Uh, a couple of years and this kind of equal mixes of uh, physicists and computer scientists, applied mathematicians, um, and uh, et cetera. And it's been, I don't know, it's been a lot of fun recently. I've been enjoying enjoying myself. Um, I also would like to uh, uh, advertise briefly that we're having a workshop of a very similar theme uh, that's uh, being held at NeurIPS uh, this year. We still don't know if it's December 13th or 14th, uh, but there's still about a week and change to submit a four page you know, extended abstract if you have some work that you'd like to show or you know someone that does. OK, so uh, I'm going to start actually with the website for this, uh, for this workshop, uh, or for this long program, actually, and read some of the things, because uh, I, I think it's, you know, I like a lot of what was being discussed, um, and also can use it kind of to help formulate this talk. So OK, so you know, machine learning is quickly providing new tools for physicists and chemists, chemists to extract essential information from a large amount of data, no, no, no surprise there. Uh, one part I wanted to highlight here is from either experiments or simulations. OK, so that the simulation ties to what I'm going to say. So I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit later. Um, you know, significant progress, yada, yada, yada. Um, and uh, of course, the ability to interrogate high dimensional complex data in a way that's uh, not been possible before. So this part, I think, is certainly uh, kind of believable. If there's one thing machine learning does well, it's working with like you know very high dimensional data. Um, and, uh, and this has typically not been what was, you know, well, you know, used natively, at least in, in a lot of the physical sciences. Um, and so if we read along here, it says, as yet, most applications of machine learning to physical sciences have been limited to uh, low-hanging fruit, uh, as they have mostly been focused on fitting pre-existing physical models to data. So I want to go into that a little bit, and I have some uh, some sort of nuance to add to that, part of which I would agree with, and part of which I would say that I, don't, I would not fully agree with that sentence. Um, and then on uh, discovering strong signals, um, I was involved in the Higgs discovery. That was a pretty weak signal. Uh, it was about you know one out of something like 10 to the 9 collisions had a Higgs boson in it. We had to go find that. So the, that was a pretty weak signal to go look for. Um, and we did use machine learning uh, a bit uh, and to, to help us do that. Um, so um, so that's, you know, I'll try to add a little bit of nuance there. Um, and then, um, and then this part is then I think getting really interesting. It says, uh, we believe that machine learning also provides an exciting opportunity to learn the models themselves. That is to learn the physical principles and structures underlying the data. So that's sort of like, you know, can we just like learn the laws of physics directly uh, using machine learning? And that's this very ambitious thing to, to try to do. Um, I think we're, uh, you know, spoiler, I think we're pretty far away from being able to do that. Um, but I am going to kind of talk a little bit about between where we are now and if that was your goal, uh, you know, things that you would need to do along the way. Um, and then, um, and that uh, with more realistic constraints, machine learning might also be able to generate and design complex, novel physical structures and objects. So that's kind of like physical chemistry, I suppose. Um, finally, physicists uh, would like to uh, not just like to fit their data, but to obtain models that are physically understandable. So that gets to this interpretability issue um, by maintaining relations and uh, predictions of the microscopic physical quantities uh, um, that are used as input. So I'll try to connect to that um, and to uh, be able to respect physically meaningful 
meaningful constraints such as conservation laws or symmetries. Okay, so there's various different things. I'll come back to these latter uh, points a little bit later on in the talk, um, but that's kind of what I'm, you know, I would like to address those sorts of issues. Um, so in terms of terminology and notation, the way that I'm thinking of it is that the observed data I'm calling X, and uh, if I have a physical theory, it has some parameters in it, and I'm calling those parameters uh, theta. So those might be, for instance, coupling constants of some you know, springs or something, or how some particles interact with each other, masses of particles, uh, cosmological constant in the universe, um, you know, various uh, things like this. Um, nuisance parameters are things that really, if you're doing an actual experiment, they might be things like calibration constants, stuff like that that are going to influence what you observe in your data, but you don't really care what the value of your calibration constant is, but you need to deal with it uh, when you're trying to, uh, you know, to do, to do inference. And then the sort of two broad directions, you know, things we do as physicists, one of them is that uh, given some parameters of interest, the parameters of my theory, I try to predict what the data looks like. So this forward model going from left to right, uh, so that's forward modeling. Or sometimes it, you might think of it as a generative model or a simulation um, or prediction. You know, you use whatever term is uh, uh, most comfortable for you. And then the inverse process, that, uh, which is more like the task, say, of uh, you know, many experimentalists where you observe some data and now you would like to say something about the theory, like these are the values of, of these parameters that are consistent with the data or these are not uh, to be able to exclude certain theories of nature or to say, say that this one is consistent with the data. Now, um, inside of this predictive machine, if you think of going from uh, left to right, um, there might be lots of things going on. Uh, so uh, for instance, if you imagined, imagined uh, simulating the solar system, uh, in the middle of that simulation, you might have like every si the location of every single rock and if it's spinning around or what it's made out of, all sorts of information. Those are what I'm calling latent variables, Z, uh, which I don't get to observe, like say with my telescope. With my telescope, all I'm gonna see is say an image of the sky um, but in my simulator, I would, you know, I would sort of know all of this stuff would be g going on. So you can imagine that these are random variables that you just don't get to observe them. And then the thing that ties everything together is what I'm writing, the probability distribution for the observed data, the latent variables given, the parameters of interest theta, and the nuisance parameters nu. Okay, so that's my notation. Is that fine? Okay, now sometimes people will sort of, uh, and especially in like Bayesian statistics, they won't sort of differentiate many of these things like the latent variables, they might just, they might just write as like P of X comma Z and that would be it. But I think it's useful to, uh, to separate out some of these different notions uh, um, for certainly for the, the context of this talk. Okay, so, um, so if you think of the simulator as some sort of black box that you set some parameters and it runs and it outputs uh, uh, observations uh, or you know synthetic observations of the data um, that that might be something that's really this is a, if you ran the simulator many many times you get different uh, outputs each time so it's really like a, some stochastic thing and uh, and it's describing some distribution uh, on the observable so there's this predictive direction now let me give you uh, and I want you to think that inside of this black box there's some mechanistic model about what all is going on. So if you're thinking about the solar system dynamics, right, you have like the gravitational interaction between all of the different, you know, clumps of matter. When they hit each other, you know about what's going on. So you, you really have some, some kind of, uh, you know, there's all your kind of physics knowledge or scientific knowledge is inside of this mechanistic model. Okay. Um, so let me give a couple examples. So cosmology, you know, very, uh, we have a theory that describes the universe at large. It's very successful. Surprisingly, that theory has six fundamental parameters to it. Here they are. They've even been measured with some error bars. And that, uh, and once you know those, you could like run a, a, well, and we do run simulations of the entire evolution of the universe. And if you ran another simulation of the universe with the same settings, you would get slightly different outputs because of uh, some quantum mechanical things that are going on early in the universe. But after those original quantum fluctuations, as they're called, uh, the rest of the evolution is basically deterministic because um, it's essentially like, a, you know, you have general relativity and classical mechanics and fluids moving around and things like that. It's all deterministic. Uh, one of the things that you can observe is if you, you know, if you have a satellite 
uh, like WMAP, looking back, you know, far, far away, back in time at the early stages of the universe. There's a period where the universe was no longer transparent, and uh, and so that's what's the imprint of what's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And the fluctuations in this encode all sorts of information about these six parameters. And so you can try to uh, measure that. Oftentimes, this very complicated map gets summarized into something like this is a power spectrum on that map. Um, and uh, and these theory, this theory, if you plug in these parameters, will predict a curve, and then you basically fit the curve to that data. And that's typically how uh, this kind of analysis is done. Okay. Um, now, inside of those simulations, again, just to tie it together, you have on the left, th these are the six parameters, the sort of like two by two you know, plots of the six parameters. Inside the simulator, there's all sorts of stuff like dark matter, which you, know, you don't get to observe directly. Um, you know, this is sort of time evolving, and these are different kinds of things with uh, gas and you know, uh, me you know, metals, uh, dark matter, various things that are going on. This is all latent, these are all latent variables. And in the end, you might get things like observed galaxies and where they uh, you know where they're, uh, what they look like, and where they are in the universe. Um, here's another example. Uh, that has to do with, uh, if you ever you know, took some physics classes, maybe you've heard of the Ising model. It has to, you know, describes, for instance, magnets with uh, ferromagnetic and paramagnetic phases. The model for this is super simple. You just have a bunch of atoms. They have a, you know, they're, they're basically uh, have a little spin that's either pointed up or down. And if they're pointed in the same way, uh, that costs some energy. And if they're pointed in opposite directions, that's better. And so you have this very simple model, which is just sum over all the pairs and add up their energy of their pairwise exchanges. So like the, the mechanistic model is incredibly simple, right? But the, uh, but the phenomena that are exhibit, exhibited in terms of uh, what go on with the orientations of these spins is pretty complicated, and it took a while for people to be able to actually solve this problem. So for theoretical physicists, there are now much more complicated versions of this, but it's the same idea. You write down what the interactions are. No one's arguing about the interactions. That's like the starting point. That's the onsets. And you just want to study like what are the phases of the system look like like as I, for instance, it changed like a, one of these parameters of my model. Um, so one more complicated version of that, which is ba basically the same, is that now instead of being like say atoms, uh, you know, on a grid, it's a, a, a chunk of space time, and now instead of there being little atoms, you're asking about the quantum mechanical fields that make up quarks, you know, that are described quarks and gluons. Uh, there's an equation for like how much energy it costs uh, for different configurations of the system. Uh, you can put it on a computer. Uh, that's called lattice quantum chromodynamics. No one's arguing about the fundamental laws, but it's it's very, very complicated uh, dynamics, and this is like a simulation of the fluctuations of the vacuum of space-time that sort of give, like, you know, give mass to atoms and things like that. So you can simulate this, and again, you kind of know the mechanistic model, but the dynamics that are going on here are super duper complicated. Me? Yes. So the mass of the atoms is known. So I'm sorry. You need to cut well. Well, so they're okay for like protons and neutrons, yes. But like once, for instance, once you, uh, if you want to know about other kinds of exotic things, you want about nuclear physics. There's all sorts of dynamics there that that you you would like to be able to predict, or you don't know, and you'd also like to just be able to show that your theory, you know, your fundamental theory actually describes the real data, right? So there's uh, there's lots of variations on a on a theme. Um, okay. Also, people just ask purely theoretical questions, like if I had a different system, how would it behave? And uh, you know, if I wanted to go, if I wanted to imagine there are some other particle, other fundamental particles floating around, how would that change things? So, okay, uh, sorry. Um, here's another example. It's not really physics, but I think it's sort of useful to have in the back of your mind. Is the, you know, if you're imagining disease spreading through a population, you know, the simplest uh, thing would be, you, you know, you have a person who's infected, and they go out in the population and they, you know, shake hands with people or something, and that person goes to the bar and eats some peanuts, and then you forget to wash your hands after the bathroom, and all of these kinds of things, and the and the disease may spread, and then when you describe that disease, you might have a few parameters like uh, how virulent is it, how long does it take before you, you know, you're in, in you're also uh, infectious. Uh, you know, what's the chance that you die? What's the chance that you recover? It's a handful of uh, parameters, and it's very easy to describe the mechanistic model. But the 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 uh, dynamics of how that disease spreads through the population becomes like really really complicated, right? So, in all of these examples, I'm just I want you to to have imagine that you know it's the kind of low level mechanistic thing is clear, but the the high level kind of aggregate effect of all of these might be very complicated. Sorry about the switching. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to now mention a few things that uh, 
uh, to kind of keep in your mind when you're thinking about different types of simulators because depending on you know what domain you're talking to what kind of you know scientists you're talking to these are I think the kind of the most common things that change so one is whether or not the simulator is deterministic or not um, so for instance fluid mechanics like the evolution of quantum states and ODEs and PDE systems those things tend to be deterministic those systems often tend to you know usually are differentiable as well maybe the actual implementation in the code is not differentiable but like in principle it should be. Um, then there are stochastic type things like these statistical systems like the Ising model that I showed when we collide particles um, and there's a scattering process uh, there's like you know the there's a quantum mechanical interaction and then the thing that you see in the classical world looks probabilistic so there's like some you know fundamental stochastic nature of what's going on and when you put that on the simulation code you know somewhere in the code there's a, like an if then else condition like this person died or not, uh, the, you know, this person caught this disease or not, or this particle decayed or not, or something like that. And that condition is a non-differentiable type of condition, okay? And so that will be an issue for like a lot of machine learning techniques, which, you know, kind of live and breathe off of derivatives. Um, the other thing is whether or not the system uh, includes measurement noise. So if you're trying to tie it to experimental data, you know, your simulator better have a model for like the observation itself, you know, and some kind of measurement noise. Uh, but if you're, for instance, a theoretical physicist trying to understand like the Ising model, you, uh, oftentimes people just imagine that you could exactly and directly observe the system because they're not worried about like measuring it. They're trying to understand like the phase diagram of the system itself or something like that. Um, so then they, they won't have a noise model. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the points about simulators, which is you know, maybe obvious, but it should be said explicitly, is if you have a simulator that can produce data, then you can kind of produce a bunch of labeled data, for, like training data, for, for use uh, downstream. So if you think about, uh, you know, the success of ImageNet and things like that, you know, the part of when it really started to work is when you had a bunch of labeled images of cats and dogs, and uh, that was done by hand, and that took a while. And so, um, you know, anything that's labeled manually is very painful, but simulators, you can basically have them produce a bunch, you know, automatically produce a bunch of labeled training data. Sometimes people say you can have it produce as much as you want, but actually many of the simulators are very, very computationally expensive, so you might actually not be able to uh, get so many simulations. So here's a couple just concrete examples. This is again like a, you know, a cosmology type situation. So you're in this example, there are only two parameters that you, that you sort of care about that describe the evolution of the universe. And then they run these very expensive um, uh, in-body gravitational simulations where each of these little dots is like a blob of dark matter and they're all interacting gravitationally and the whole system evolves deterministically. Um, and then uh, and you do that many different times for, you know, for different initial conditions. But they're so expensive that you, can, you, know, you might only have like hundreds or thousands of examples. You don't have millions of examples because these uh, simulations are very expensive. And then what uh, this group did was they said, okay, well, can we take this like, you know, this uh, three-dimensional volume of, uh, of where dark matter is distributed as input and try to predict the parameters, uh, the, cosmolog the cosmological parameters. Uh, and, uh, and so by doing that, just had, they ran the simulator a bunch, they made a bunch of uh, you know, pairs, of XY pairs, trained a model, it's basically a big regression problem, um, and, uh, you know, and it worked pretty well. So that's kind of, so that's not super surprising, and I would, you know, even though it's pretty, it's pretty impressive, it's also kind of in the, maybe the low-hanging fruit column. Yes? So when you say n, uh, n body, is it an n squared particle interaction? Yeah, I mean, in body is just the name for like I have in bodies and they're all interacting. But yeah, they're all yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, I also mentioned this example of the like uh, you know lattice QCD with the fluctuating blobs of uh, what's going on. Um, so in these uh, these examples, the state of the art simulations, uh, it's a four dimensional space time volume on a lattice. There's something like ten to the seven lattice sites. At each lattice site. There's data describing what's going on with the quarks and gluons, and that's something like 32 real numbers. So you have something like 10 to the 8 real numbers per data point. You know, each example, 10 to the 8 numbers. And, uh, and, then, and then you're trying to basically describe the distribution over that 10 to the 8 dimensional object. And, uh, and the, it's, they, you know, they use essentially fancy Markov chain Monte Carlo, and they can give you about 100 examples, right? So like the regime that you're in is very, very strange, right? Um, and so each one is huge, and there's also the problem that you can't really chunk it up into little small parts for, for either, uh, 
I'm going to give up on this uh, thing, uh, for, for either of these problems because the distribution of the data is, is, uh, is kind of scale free. There's, there's structure at all scales. So you, if you chunk it into little small pieces, you're destroying that structure. Okay. All right. So in those two examples that I just showed you, uh, you have training data from the simulator, which you can think of as sort of XY pairs. And then your, and then your goal in, in the, those examples is to say train a neural network that when you give it input, it tries to predict Y. Okay. You know, so it's like a regression problem. This is what I would consider, I'm hoping was being referred to as the kind of low hanging fruit as things roughly of this, of this category. Um, in these examples, you know, it's a, that predictive model is a point estimate. So for instance, something like a maximum likelihood estimate um, but in science oftentimes it depends on what you're doing you know what your goal is but and in, in many cases what you would really like to have is like an error you know an uncertainty associated to that prediction so uh, or in the form of like a likelihood like given the, the obser observation X what's the likelihood uh, Y or the posterior distribution of the probability of Y given that X and th this is much harder and so I would not consider this low-hanging fruit at all and most of this has not been possible until kind of recently and there's been some progress recently. Okay, okay. So again, uh, here's the, my sort of diagram. I'll come back to it a few times. I'm observing x. I want to do inference on either the parameters of interest or maybe also the latent variables inside and try to ask something about what was going on. Okay, so here's an, an example to try to get across like why is it hard. So uh, here is a video I took of this thing called the Galton board. Um, so the the you know, the, the little balls bounce through there, nothing really exciting. Um, you, you know, probably these are kind of in the middle, but you, know, you could imagine that the, the, the little plastic pins are kind of biased to the left or to the right. So I'm gonna call theta the probability that the ball bounces to the right, okay? And then uh, the number of times it bounces to the right is given by, I don't know, what would you expect this distribution to be? I mean, something like, this looks kind of like a Gaussian, but you know, it's discrete, so it's not a Gaussian. I would, I would think it would be the binomial distribution, where it's like, how many times did I go right, given there's 12 rows. So I would think it would be like binomial of 12 given point five, you know, comma 0.5 or something. Um, so I was teaching an undergraduate physics class, and I went to give this example, and then I went, you know, I was going to show that it matched. So if you do that, though, the, the, the distribution here is, is like this wide. <laughs> so this is like way broader than it should be if it's a binomial. And then I was looking at it and I realized, oh, well, actually the number of things here doesn't actually match there. And I tried to correct it and it still was wrong. And then I was like really confused and I was trying to figure out like what's, what's wrong. Okay, um, and so I'll come back. Well, actually maybe I'll go ahead and show you. Okay, so, and then I took a, use my phone and I made like a slow motion video. So here's a slow motion video of what's going on. Like watch some of these balls. Like they're bouncing around like, you know, they're hopping all around, they're bouncing around. You know, the suit, it's much more complicated. It's not like it's a do, 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 you know. Um, and yeah, so, so this, is, this is hard. So at this point, you might say, OK, if I want to do inference in this, it's not going to be some like, nice equation, right? But I can still simulate this. And in fact, uh, my collaborator, he wrote a little Python thing, hooked it up to a little physics engine. So it pretty much looks right, you know? So now you could imagine that you actually could infer like the sizes of the balls, the locations of the balls, how elastic they are, all sorts of things, right? Um, so this is another example uh, of kind of simulation-based inference. Um, but let me also go back to just this distribution itself. Here's another a case where imagine it's not bouncing around; it's just, you know, going through, uh, and it just goes one, you know, to the left or to the right. But what I'm going to do is instead of having them all be in the same location, I'm going to move them. Like each one, I'm going to go move. So the things that are red, I've kind of biased to the right a little bit. The things that are blue, I've kind of biased to the left a little bit. I made this weird pattern. I ran the simulation many, many times. I can get distributions that aren't even unimodal. I can make weird looking stuff. Okay. So if I wanted to know what this distribution is, what is it? Well. It's, it's uh, you know, x is like the location it, an it ended, z, the latent variable, is the path it took through there. So the probability of landing in one of these bins, I need to add up, you know, all the different ways that you could get there. Here's two examples for how to get there, right? The problem is that normally in the, uh, in the binomial case, you can do that at some 
uh, easily because there's just some combinatorial effect and everything has the you know, known probabilities. In this case, you can't do that anymore. You like, have to literally sum over all, of the, uh, over all the options, right? And this very quickly is going to blow up, right? There's going to be a gargantuan number of latent paths that give you the same observed x, right? And so because of that, this, this, this uh, likelihood, probability of x given theta, becomes intractable because of this, this gargantuan integral or sum over all the latent states. And if you think about you know, complicated simulators, that's like very, very intractable. You know? um, so this is kind of one of the key points. So hopefully, this, if anyone has questions, please ask or say something or object or something. Um, so a lot of times physicists are like, that's not intractable. I can solve it. I'm going to put on my thinking hat. And, but like, for, that's not really the point. The point is that like, you know, this, you're basically always going to hit some system that is going to get too big. And so for purposes of the discussion, you know, this thing is intractable. OK, um, so now the question is, how would I do inference uh, in, a, you know, in a situation like this um, where the, the likelihood is intractable? OK, um, I already showed you that. Okay, so here we go again. We have my simulator. It gives me observations. I want to do inference. My likelihood function is intractable. So my my goal basically, and this is the misnomer. This is often called the setting of quote likelihood free inference. That's my title here. So likelihood free inference is not really like uh, doing inference where you throw away the whole idea of the likelihood function. It's really the likelihood function it's the, is kind of intractable, so I need to estimate the likelihood function, and then I'm going to do normal normal inference. Is that is that fine? Yes. Like in, in this situation, uh, this is really killing me. Um, the, I'm imagining I sort of say maybe I know this, but I, but this integral is intractable, so then I don't know this. Yeah, it's high, but it might be. I'll show other examples where it like might be crazy high dimensional, especially if the simulator was. Say the simulator is really crazy. Like if you hit this one, then it tells like all these to like disappear or something. You know, like the the, the dimensionality of the space might not even be. Uh, like constant, right? So you could any you can just write kind of arbitrary Turing complete simulator, and the, the thing that you're integrating over is like the space of traces of these programs now. Okay. Um, okay. So where am I? Okay, right. So I'm having a real hard time uh, navigating here. Today. Okay. So this is likelihood free inference, and the goal, as I'm saying again, is basically to estimate the likelihood function and then do sort of traditional inference after the fact. Um, so this is a common theme in like a lot of different areas. So these are some websites about from workshops that were devoted to this. There was a, a technique called approximate Bayesian computation, or ABC, which was for a long time basically synonymous with likelihood free inference because it's like the only technique that people had really developed for dealing with it. It was uh, it says here it was you know uh, you know a class of computational statistical methods for Bayesian inference under intractable likelihoods. Uh, it's used for a, a, a you know. A, uh, well, this is, a, I think, important. It was developed mostly beyond the radar of the machine learning community, but are important tools for a large and diverse segment of the scientific community, such as systems and population biology, computational neuroscience, computer vision, et cetera, et cetera. Um, particle physics wasn't listed, but now, now at the ICML 2017 workshop was kind of also about this topic. And now they give these, you know, again, here you see several real world phenomena are better described by simulators that do not admit a tractable density. That's the kind of way that oftentimes people phrase it, you know, just the simulator is describing a distribution, but you don't know what the, the density or the likelihood function looks like. And there's, for instance, you know, particle physics examples. And then they say, OK, there's a, you know, a bunch of different activity in the deep learning community. And these are kind of funny because uh, here's approximate Bayesian computation, this likelihood free type stuff. But there are other things. So there's generative adversarial networks, GANs. Have you who's heard of GANs? Yeah, OK. Um, variational inference, maybe. Um, and, then, uh, and then other kinds of things related to two sample testing, density ratios, et cetera. So there's like uh, a bunch of different work happening in different areas that are all really very, very closely related. So that's what that workshop was about. Um, and so you know, I think in terms of if I were to kind of broadly classify different approaches for this, uh, uh, one would be that you're going to try to use your simulator. Here's my little schematic that I'll come back to of like a particle physics simulation. Uh, you're going to try to use the simulator directly for doing your inference, but you need to be somehow clever about how you do it. And that includes things like uh, ABC, probabilistic programming, 
ad, you know, adversarial variational optimization. And then there are other approaches where you, you run your simulator some, and then you try to learn the simulator with, say, a, a deep neural network, and this becomes like a surrogate. It's some approximation of the simulation, and then you're going to use this thing for inference. And that includes roughly things like uh, uh, GANs, variational autoencoders, uh, this approach to doing it where, where you use classifiers to approximate likelihood ratios, and some other uh, high dimensional density estimation techniques. Okay. Um, all right, now also again in the spirit of tutorials, I'm going to throw up this uh, kind of dichotomy. I don't know if you're familiar with the, this terminology, but in machine learning there's sort of two paradigms that people often refer to. One is called the discriminative uh, approach and the other one is the generative approach. And so the discriminative approach is roughly where most of deep learning sits. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, you know, largely uh, I have like XY pairs, it's a supervised learning problem, and I'm basically trying to learn this function. And then once I learn it, I you know, apply it to make, for making my predictions. But when I, when I, so if I learn, if I think of it as a function approximation problem, that's one thing, and you contrast that to generative models where you actually try to learn a model for the distribution over the data itself, okay? So you actually try to learn the joint distribution of X and Y together. And if you can learn that, which is harder, then you can condition on you know, X to get the probability of Y given X, and you can do all sorts of things, okay? So that includes things like Bayesian networks, probabilistic programs, and simulator models, which I'm largely talking about. And then, so this is a slide from Max Welling. Um, very well known machine learning researcher and former physicist. Um, and if you, you know, if you look at these points he's making, you know, deep learning, very successful and accurate, but kind of for these like very well specified, relatively narrow problems. And the stuff on the right are things that a lot of um, scientists care about. The ability to inject uh, expert knowledge, model causal relationships, be interpretable, be data efficient, uh, robust to domain shift. This is like the computer science way of saying uh, robust to systematic uncertainties. Um, and facilitate you know, unsupervised learning and various things. So these are like lots of properties that I think scientists would like. This is kind of most of traditional deep learning, and now there's a fusion of these ideas. So they're not really, uh, they're not uh, exclusive. And so the variational autoencoder is like one technique that Max was involved with uh, helping develop, and so, the, so that's, you know, so he puts it here at the, at the uh, intersection. So I'm gonna talk for a little bit about generative models and deep generative models, because that's where most of the work has been. So one was this variational autoencoder. I'm not gonna really describe it, other than it was one of the early techniques that could do things like make, you know, generate examples of people's faces. And so it's kind of trying to learn the distribution over people's faces, and it would have essentially some noise source, which was called Z, some latent variable, and then it would, uh, you know, say take, a, you know, a thousand random Gaussian distributed numbers, and then run it through a neural network, and the output of the neural network would be the pixel values of this image, and then you update the neural network so that when you take your Gaussian distributed random numbers and run it through the neural network, they actually look like faces. And then there was a, a technique for how you update the neural network to make it look like you want. Um, so that was one of the early, uh, early approaches. Um, and when, the, when it mentioned variational inference earlier, that's largely what was being referred to because the way it's, it's trained is through variational inference. Um, the other one is the, uh, the GAN, the Generative Adversarial Network. So again, here you know, this idea that you have a noise source, you run it through a neural network, and usually what you get out at first is garbage. Um, and, then, but, uh, and then you have like real examples of say volcanoes or birds or something like that. And then you train uh, uh, an adversary, which is like a classifier, trying to tell the different, like is this ex image that came out a real image of a volcano or one of your generated images? And so it's sort of like a counterfeiter and then the person trying to like compete against them. And it gets set up as a minimax type of problem, and there's like a Nash equilibrium, and you can characterize it, and it, it should be the right distribution if this thing converges. Okay, um, and so the reason that you're you're training it through this complicated way, as opposed to something more straightforward, which would be just to, if you normally if you want to learn a distribution, you do maximum likelihood or something like that. So why aren't you doing maximum likelihood? Because these forward models are also. Uh, like implicit models, they ha do not have a tractable density. There's, you, people don't, don't know, you can run the thing forward, but given one of those outputs, you don't know what the density of it is, because there's multiple things that could map into it, and there's like the equivalent version of this intractable integral hiding somewhere. So, uh, so this way of training it was some idea, and that's why GANs are sort of being mentioned. 
So these two things that you should remember is that GANs and VAEs use deep neural networks to transform some latent variable Z to the observed data X. The resulting density for the X's is intractable. Uh, because of that, you have to come up with some other way of training it. Um, you often say that the density is implicit. Um, and then the other point here is that the latent space Z, you know, doesn't mean anything really. It's just a bunch of random numbers that are the input to a neural network, right? You could have like chopped off the neural network somewhere in the middle and called those the latent variables. Um, it's not, uh, so from like a physicist's point of view, it's not really the same kind of latent variables that we were talking about before that like are inside of your simulator that really mean something. Okay. Um, so now here's another uh, uh, type of, uh, of generative, deep generative model uh, where the likelihood uh, is uh, tractable. Uh, the way you do is you say my high dimensional likelihood function, I'm going to write it out. You can always rewrite it as a product where, of like conditionals. So this is like the chain rule you know, for probabilities. So this is just some really long set of conditionals. Um, and, uh, and then you basically try to learn uh, what the, uh, so this is now like a one dimensional distribution conditioned on everything before it. And so you try to learn these one-dimensional distributions. And so here's an example of some neural network that's sort of generating this waveform time step by time step. So the output is like how high, what's the amplitude of this wave, you know, at time t, and then the next time step, and the next time step. And so if you, uh, if you did it many, many times, you would get out not the same audio each time. You get out different audio because it's a probability distribution, um, but you would be sampling, and this is some incredibly high dimensional distribution, right? Um, so now listen to this audio. The avocado is a pear shaped fruit with leather skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. Right, so that's like a, that's a pretty impressive uh, sample. Like, so this is the audio version of looking at the pictures of people's faces, right? Um, and so unlike the GAN situation, this one you could actually take the audio that I'm saying right now and ask like, what's the likelihood of you know the text that I that you just heard, right? So that 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 is a you know much more powerful thing if you can do it. Um, another approach that's being done, which also has these uh, attractable likelihood function, or what's called uh, normalizing flows, or it's also based on bijections. Uh, and the idea here is, is is also related to what we heard earlier about the neural neural. Uh, ODEs and things like this, is you start off with a simple distribution, which might be like a Gaussian distribution and, you know, a thousand dimensions or something. You run that through a neural network uh, until it gets to the space of your data. Um, and, uh, but now your neural network has to be constrained so that it's invertible. So I could take a point here and run it backwards to this space. So I, that's why it has to be a bijection. Um, and it also, in the, in the case of GANs, oftentimes the latent space is much smaller than the number of dimensions of your output. Here the latent space has to have the same dimensionality as your output, so that it's a, a real bijection. And then if you have that, then the density over here is just the density you started with times the determinant of the you know, Jacobian of, the, of uh, that function, okay? So this is just like the change of variables formula. Um, and then you, uh, and that function is a neural network, so you update its parameters and you train this thing with maximum likelihood. And then there's some, then there's various tricks about how do you actually build a neural network that's invertible that way, and there's various structures that people have come up with, and that you want this uh, Jacobian to have like a lower triangular uh, determinant so that it's, uh, I mean, a, a Jacob, you want it to be a lower triangular Jacobian so that it's efficient to, uh, to take this determinant and various things like that. So people come up with uh, various types of deep neural networks to parameterize those functions. Okay, so that's just like, I'm, I know I'm being fast, but these are the kinds of things that are going on in deep, uh, uh, deep generative models. The other version of it is kind of the continuous time version of the same thing that I mentioned, where you start off with a simple distribution like a Gaussian, and then instead of doing you know layer, 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 you let that thing evolve with a, an, an a ordinary differential equation until it gets to here, and, as, and then through the same techniques we were hearing about earlier today, uh, you can evaluate this density. So this uh, this approach is called uh, Fjord, um, if I'm pronouncing that you know correctly. And here you see some, you know some. Uh, and a comparison of different techniques, variational autocoders, GANs, autoregressive models, normalizing flows, et cetera, et cetera. And then the kinds of checklists about you know, good and bad things. Um, one thing that I'll mention here is that, the, uh, is that there's checks and X, Xs here for one pass sampling. And what that means is that in that autoregressive one, you had to do like one time step of that audio and then the next time step and the next time step. So to make the whole audio is really slow because you have to 
if, if you could just in one shot say, here's the whole audio clip, uh, that's much faster, right? And so if you're Google and you want to like put something on a phone and you want it to go fast, like that's what you're that's what you care about. So that's why it's a check and an X. Uh, if you're a physicist and you would like to know what's going on inside, like I don't want to just say like here's a hundred million random numbers and here's an example of what the universe looks like, I would like to say, like, this is how it evolved throughout time, right? And so this idea of being able to actually have time steps along the way is kind of an advantage uh, from an interpretability point of view. So, uh, so if you care about interpretability, you should probably change all the x's to checks and the checks to x's. OK. Um, all right, so, um, so yes? Yeah, no, the whole joint the whole joint distribution evolves together. Yeah, because you just said that for interpretability, it's better to exchange the axes and the checks. Yeah, so I mean, this one is a little bit weird because you could go, you could imagine that you actually read out what you could evolve it for some amount of time and see what happens. So yeah, so th it's a bit ambiguous how you color this, right? Yeah, yeah. But but it's also still true that they start with, you know. Uh, a bunch of random variables and then evolve them all to together as opposed to, so there's a notion of time, but it's uh, at every point in time you have all the variables. So it's maybe a little bit more, you know, it's a little tougher. Um, so I'll have some other examples that look very different later structurally and that might help. Okay, how am I on time? All right. Okay, so um, so I'm going to go through a couple examples of like likelihood-based uh, inference, or like sorry, likelihood-free inference, which is what it's traditionally been called. I've interacted with enough people that find this name misleading and kind of annoying, since in the end, the way that you do inferences still involves a likelihood function that's the typical statistical inference. It's just that you have this upfront step where you have to estimate the likelihood function. Uh, that uh, I, I'm starting to prefer more and more this idea, this term simulation-based inference, but whatever. Um, OK. Uh, the clicker is uh, sticking for me. OK, so here's an example. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the Atlas detector at CERN's Large Hadron Collider. I work on this one. This thing right here is about the size of an 11-story building, so it's large. Um, this, uh, protons are coming in and smashing into each other. There's a collision with a bunch of stuff flying out. Um, and the detector is, you know, all these little blobs are things that the detector is measuring. And this is just a visualization of an actual collision event. And these four red lines are particles called muons that were able to fly all the way through the detector. And this is the kind of collision that you would expect would result from if you produced a Higgs boson. Um, but you don't know that that's what happened because, because of quantum mechanics, it could have been something else. But uh, it's consistent with it being a Higgs boson. Um, so now when you go to, when you, so that's what the data would look like. So that, that's an example of the data. Uh, in terms of the model that's trying to predict what's going on, it starts off with, you know, fundamental particle physics, quantum field theory things, you know, particles and symmetry groups and things like that. Uh, when you take this as the Lagrangian, you can do a, a kind of expansion around it. This is basically like a Taylor expansion, and you can represent that Taylor expansion through pictorial diagrams called Feynman diagrams. So here's an example of a scattering process that produced the Higgs boson along with some other stuff. Um, after you do, this is the part that you can actually do with a pencil and paper. Um, I mean, you need to, like, this is what I would teach my graduate students how to do with a pencil and paper. You can do the red part. But after that, there's another process that starts to get, um, you know, gets to be a bit more complicated where each of the red lines starts radiating off quarks and gluons. And uh, you can kind of describe what's going on for each one of them, but there's a bunch of them. And so you would have to like sum it up by hand or something, which is not tractable, so you have to stick that on a computer. And then, uh, and then there's another process that happens where um, at this point, the theory becomes like not uh, amenable to doing these like Taylor expansions anymore. And so you don't really know what to do here, but you can measure it in data. So it switches now to like instead of first principles calculation, something that's basically been tabulated through other experiments, and it's like lookup tables, okay. And then you get to these dark green things here, which are like physical particles flying off into my detector, and then, so there we go. Now I embedded this inside. This is all you know happening in a much smaller than an atom kind of distance scale. And then these green particles come flying off and smack into the detector, which is very large. Uh, they, ion, they bend in magnetic fields. They ionize atoms. The you know, energy is collected. All sorts of complicated stuff happens. And you have uh, detector sensors that read out you know, you know, whatever happened there. Um, but if you wanted to ask, for instance, what's the probability that one of these detector sensors you know, 
you know, said you know, 3.2 volts, you would have to integrate over all the possible things that happened here and all the possible things that happened here that all give you 3.2 volts, right? And that's like an impossibly high dimensional integral. There's something like a billion random numbers for one simulated event at the LHC. So, um, okay, so this is, that's what it looks like. So I've written here that, you know, conceptually, this simulator is describing the probability of the detector response uh, given, say, these incoming particles. Uh, the way that it's done in practice is that you sample this thing through some Monte Carlo procedure, so you get out a distribution, uh, or like samples from a distribution, but the consequence of it is that the likelihood, again, is intractable. So it's one of these likelihood-free problems. So what we you know, traditionally did, like in the discovery of the Higgs particle, is we would run the simulation many, many times. The output of the simulation each time is very complicated. There's something like 100 million electronic uh, sensors in the, in the detectors, so it's like a very big camera. Um, and then, but we don't try to treat the 100 million dimensional data. We, we know what's kind of important. We, we can see this is a blob of stuff that was probably came from a particle, so we add up all the energy contributions there and say this particle had that energy. And this one here, had some amount of energy, this particle had some energy and momenta, and then we like we know that energy and momenta are conserved, and we can kind of take all this stuff and try to figure out what happened in the inside. And what we would normally do is, uh, is then combine all that stuff into a single number, which is like statisticians would call a, a summary statistic, and that's this axis, and then run the simulation many, many times and build a histogram of it. That's what the red looks like. So the red is the prediction of what this summary statistics distribution should look like under the standard model in this description of the detector, okay? And then the black dots are the observed data, and as you can tell, there's like a, a big bump here where the, you didn't predict anything, and that ends up getting filled up by you know, the Higgs particle, okay? So, um, so that's sort of the procedure. That's how we've been able to make uh, progress thus far. But the important part is that we kind of knew a good summary statistic to take the high dimensional data and project it down to. Um, and, uh, and we basically used the, the histogram here is playing the role of approximating this complicated distribution, right? So it's such a simple thing that we kind of never really realized we were doing it. Um, and so if you think about the probability in one of these histogram bins, it's exactly doing this integral for you through Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, but you, but, and, and so you should think of this histogram as this estimate of P of X given theta. Okay. All right, um, but th the problem is that this doesn't work if the X is high dimensional and you really wanna work with high dimensional data. If you didn't know how to summarize the data efficiently, you know, what would you do, right? Um, so if you didn't know that this, this variable was good for discovering the Higgs and you just had like the raw LHC data, what do you do, right? And now that we've discovered the Higgs, we're trying to test it and look to see if maybe it's a slightly different, you know, version of the Higgs. And in that case, these are some, you know, these are pictures of Feynman diagrams and like a particle being produced and all the decay angles of particles and stuff flying out. These are histograms of those various angles. And you can see that under different scenarios that people consider, those distributions all might look different. Uh, but, we're, but the information is hiding in some like, you know, subtle correlations in these high dimensional variables and we'd like to use all of that information if possible. So how do you do it if you don't know how to kind of summarize it into one variable? So, um, so what are we losing from feature engineering? And what if we don't know what a good feature is? How do you approach this problem? So one way to do it is, uh, is to use uh, machine learning, okay? And so I'm gonna go through this one kind of carefully. Um, so, the, so the idea here is there's, you know, the, there's, this is like a typical binary classifier. You've got red dots and blue dots. You know, here's your, the space of your data is just two-dimensional in this case. So I've got red dots and blue dots, and I want to try to learn to classify if a new dot is, should be called red or blue, right? So these are my training data, and then I wanna classify. And these, uh, these little, you know, contours are different ways that different machine learning techniques try to estimate, you know, what it should, the answer should be. Um, and uh, so in this example, you could think of red dots as cats and blue, blue dots as dogs. When you get a bunch of cat and dog images, you don't know their likelihood, right? You don't know the density for this is a cat or this is a dog. You just have a bunch of examples of cats and dogs, right? Um, if you did know the distribution, you would just take the ratio of their two likelihoods, that's a likelihood ratio, and you can prove that that's the optimal classifier. That's the Nyman-Pearson lemma, and you'd be done. But if you don't have that likelihood ratio, then you, you resort to you know, mach machine learning techniques, right? So this is one thing is that, okay, if I'm going to do machine learning, 
I need a loss function, so let me just come up with some loss function. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say call like the whatever the blue dots, uh, you know, y equals one. That's like the and then the red dots y equals zero. I'm going to have a function s of x where you that's my neural network. You give it an example. It's going to output a number, and I want it s to give me one if it's came from if it's a a blue dot. That's what I called h1, like my alternate hypothesis say, and I want uh, s to give me zero if the data came out of the the, the red dots, the null hypothesis. So here's some, you know, some loss function that I can write down. It's a real functional. So I would normally use calculus of variations to, to solve this problem. You can do it. If you do calculus of variations, this is the function that extremizes that thing. This is the, what's called the Bayes optimal classifier. And it's one to one with the likelihood ratio, which you also know is the optimal solution to this problem from the Nyman Pearson lemma. Okay, so this is like the answer. But I can't evaluate this integral because I don't know this density. Right? But I can uh, approximate that integral with samples. Right? This is just a Monte Carlo approximation of that, of that loss function. So if I can sample from the, red, the unknown red distribution and the unknown blue distribution, I can approximate this loss function, and then I can try to optimize it. And then I, instead of all possible functions, I stick a neural network that's super flexible, and I run SGD, and I get, a, and I get an S. Okay, so that's, so I think of machine learning as kind of applied calculus of variations. Okay, so now that I have S, what am I, you know, that, that's great, that solved my binary uh, problem, but how can I use it for likelihood free inference? Um, so here, this is just a point that if I change H0 and H1, red dots and blue dots, to be real data and simulated data from my, my GAN or whatever, that's the same thing that the discriminator in the GAN is doing. It's trying to tell the difference between the real examples and the, sim and the synthetic examples. So you train a classifier, tries to learn that. It's basically one-to-one -one with the likelihood function. So this is very, very closely connected to GANs. Um, now, the, the difference is that, in this case, the thing that we're actually after is the likelihood ratio itself. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is just say, these were two discrete distributions. Like, I just had two different distributions, red and blue dots, right? Now what I can do is kind of lift this and generalize it to a theory uh, that has a parameter space theta. And I can just choose any two points in my parameter space, theta, call them theta naught and theta one, and just rewrite the same equation like this, right? So what it's saying is now, I, instead of having a classifier that only depends on x, where I give, it, I give it my example and it gives me out a number, I give it x and the two values of theta that I want to compare. So this neural network you know, takes in three arguments, the observed data and the two values of the parameter points that I want to compare, and it's going to estimate for me a function that's one-to-one -one with the likelihood ratio. And if I can do that, and it's parameterized in theta, I can do inference. So this, this kind of classifier is what I call a parameterized classifier. This is a paper where we wrote about this stuff. And once you have it, then you can start to do likelihood free inference. So this is the kind of high level picture. I have my simulator. I know what value of theta I use to run it. It has a bunch of latent variables inside that I don't really care about. It's going to output some observables x. I'm going to use the values of theta and the observables as input to my neural network. Uh, and then it's going to output a likelihood ratio. Um, now, this is very different than the thing we did before, which was a point estimate, where x was the input and the output was an estimate of theta, right? Now I'm giving x and theta as input, and I'll hold x fixed, and I'll scan theta and see which value of theta is like the best fit, what are the error bars, what's the posterior, I can do any kind of inference that I want. And so from that, I'll have now inference on theta. Okay, so, um, so this is, sorry about that, uh, so this is kind of a two-stage uh, process, right? Um, well. OK, whatever. Um, OK, so the, uh, and, and I, this is kind of a point in terms of for the mathematical part of the audience, is that there's a ton of mathematics about, you know, uh, in computer science literature about doing inference for problems of various sizes. There's also a bunch of inference um, literature about how well you can approximate these, these functions. And really, you would like to put the two together and think about, like, how well can I treat this joint problem? And uh, there's, like, basically no theory that I know of on this, and it's not really the, you know, what I'm kind of trained for doing. Okay, so one thing that we realized recently is that we can improve this situation dramatically because there's, we can extract more information out of the simulator than just a bunch of examples x. Um, and what, so I'm gonna call those r and t, those are the, this augmented data, and I'll just kind of quickly go through that, and for the interest of time, I'll kind of not go through it super carefully. But the idea, if you go back to the situation of thinking about the simulator, here are like two different paths that give you the same value of x. And there's two different z paths, right? 
So normally this thing is intractable. This, this integral over z is intractable. But if I hold z fixed, like say I'm the blue path, um, I'm going to hold that fixed. Um, I can consider what's the likelihood ratio, like how much more likely is the blue path under one value of theta and versus another value of theta. So this kind of likelihood ratio that depends on both the observables and all of the latent variables, this thing is tractable oftentimes. Um, and also, if you don't know the like kind of normalizing constant, this can still be tractable. Um, and it also works if your simulator is non-differentiable. Like this simulator is totally non-differentiable. You're bouncing left or right, you know? Um, but so I hold that path fixed, and then I can take this ratio, and the other thing that I can do is the kind of local version of this is based on one of those, I can say like how much more or less likely would it be if I changed theta a little bit. So I can take the derivative with respect to theta of the log likelihood that depends on both the observables x and the latent variable z and evaluate it somewhere. And this, is, this statistical object is called the score. Okay, and it's related to all sorts of stuff about, you know, uh, it's related to Fisher information and you know, you know, some you know sufficient statistics, all sorts of things. Um, so these are like two very very useful things, and this is also very closely connected to reinforcement learning um, uh, and what are called the you know reinforced policy gradients. Okay, so with this information that I can get out of the simulator, I turn my problem just graphically. And st so here, this axis is x, and the dots are say outputs of my simulator. So the, the situation I was in before is that I had outputs of my simulator for one value of theta and outputs of my simulator for another value of theta. And I'm trying to learn this red curve, right? That's very hard, right? You know, I mean, this is like the label y equals zero or y equals one, right? So it's like two sets of magnets pulling on, on some cable and like who's gonna win, right? You're trying to learn this red curve based on that data. That's very hard, very high variance. And what we've turned it into is a situation where the output of the simulator looks like these dots or, or this thing, including like tangent vectors for this grade, you know, this score variable. And so if you put everything together, your training data looks like this and you're trying to learn basically the surface, which is the likelihood ratio as a function of x and theta, and that's gonna be a much easier problem than just trying to work with this data up here. So when you put all of that stuff together, uh, I'm not, these are the sort of theorems that about how the loss function does what you want, uh, I'm not gonna go through it, uh, but when you, when you do it, this is basically how much training data do you need and this is how accurately are you estimating the likelihood ratio. And, what, and this is a logarithmic scale. So this over here is uh, 10 million training examples. Um, and uh, over here is uh, 10,000 training examples, 1,000 training examples. So with these, tech, these techniques that I'm talking about, with something like 5,000 training examples, you're doing better than you know, a few million examples from the traditional way. So this is basically just What's going on here is basically, can we come up with a smarter way to train these things because the simulated data might be very expensive? And now once you have like a very good estimate of the log likelihood ratio, then you can do inference. So in the case of the Higgs, here's a collision that happened. The observed data is 42 dimensional. So 42 dimensional distributions, like not, you know, not small, but not like, you know, it's not a million dimensional or something, but it's pretty complicated. And in this case, we work with something where we know what the ground truth is. And this is how well we estimate the likelihood ratio. There's like true likelihood, estimated likelihood. It's a very nice scatter point. And then we do inference. These are like log likelihood curves. And in terms of like real impact on LHC physics, that for studying the Higgs boson, this is like adding 90% more data at the LHC, which is like, you know, billions of dollars of data, right? So the, so this is, uh, yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, this is interesting and definitely like an example where you know it's worth worth uh, working. And I wouldn't call this like low hanging fruit exactly. So, um, okay. Um, so I'm going to skip over this stuff. This is about the, how you can use the score for other cases. Some people have been applying this kind of, these kinds of ideas to cosmology. Um, I'll quickly show this example just because it looks really cool. Um, this is a. Uh, anyone know what this is? Yeah, so there's a, there's a galaxy here, and there's another galaxy really far away behind, like almost directly behind it, and its light is being bent because of general relativity around this thing, and it's called a gravitational lens. So this is the, the galaxy behind it, and you can kind of, you know, it's all distorted and stretched out and stuff. Whoops. Um, so this is kind of a picture of, you know, the, the far away galaxy going, being lensed by this thing, and here we are observing it. Um, so one of the things that's interesting is that, uh, you know, you know, you can use this to basically weigh how much dark matter is around that galaxy. But the dark matter is also not perfectly smooth, it's clumpy. 
And the way that it's clumpy has all sorts of interesting information in it about what's the nature of dark matter. So if you could somehow resolve the clumpiness of what's going on, that would be great. But that's very hard. Um, you know, you can kind of like this is your data, right? So we, but you can simulate what's going on here very well. I mean, we know what the lensing equations are. Everything's fine. So we wrote a simulator. It's also a differentiable like lensing simulator. And uh, here are examples of one of these lenses. And uh, we also include like the noise model of the telescope and various things like that. The little blue dots are where these little clumps of dark matter are. They're much, much smaller than the, uh, the big, huge hunk of dark matter around the galaxy. And they perturb these images very slightly. I mean, you can't, like, it's not really visible, uh, but you can, you can barely tell it's there. Uh, but we can then, without, we don't know what a good summary statistic is on these images that's going to tell us about what's going on with dark matter. And what we really care is not the location of all of these blue dots, which are the latent variables. We care about the population. And that's a very simple thing. It's like a power law kind of. So this is the distribution of, of these, uh, the mass of these subhalos um, as a function of the mass of the subhalo. And it's a, just a two-parameter model. So what we really care about is the inference on this two-parameter model, not where all the little dots are. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so then, uh, so we were able to train this thing. And, uh, and uh, so here we don't know what a good summary statistic is, but we learned this likelihood ratio. And here we're like collecting more data, more of these lenses. And here you see the posterior distribution of this two parameter family getting sharper and sharper as we add more data. So this is like enabling you know, new science about dark matter that we weren't able to do before. So again, you know, at the beginning of the slides, I talked about this like fitting pre-existing models to data. Like, yes, that's what I would like to be able to do, but I didn't know how to do that before. So this is like, this is, uh, this is impactful. Okay, now for the last little bit, I'll, I'll have to sort of zip along. The last bit is kind of more like uh, some high level points, but when you get into this uh, exciting opportunity to actually learn the models themselves, right? The, if, so what I've talked about before is like we kind of know the model and we're just trying to do inference on the parameters. But what I would like you to recognize is how hard that was, right? Now imagine you don't know the model. Like you don't have the simulator. You just have a bunch of these images or something and you're trying to understand the laws of physics. Like that is a, a much, much, much harder problem. Um, so one thing is like in generative models, people often refer to this quote from Richard Feynman, you know, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And then they'll show these things, right? But like, you know, the same neural network is able to make pictures of volcanoes and ants and monasteries. Like, and you know, you could ask, did this, does this model understand what these things are? Like in my mind, this, these, it doesn't, it's learned some statistical properties, but it does not know like the model for ants, right? Um, and the fact that it, the same model can, that I can might use to, you know, model LHC data can model volcanoes doesn't make me feel comfortable, right? It means there's so many more failure modes open that I need to worry about, right? So the main point here is that correlation is not causation, right? Um, so if you think of generative models, in one sense, a generative model like a GAN that takes noise and produces volcanoes is sort of like a simulator that takes random variables and produces simulations of LHC data. The big difference between them, they both describe distributions, like big you know, implicit distributions, but the simulator is a, is a causal model. Right? I could go in there and say what happened if like my electrical thing shorted and I don't have any, like all these channels are dead and re-simulate the data and see what the data would look like. You know, I can make, that's a prediction of something that, uh, that is not, doesn't exist in some ex data that I have now, right? You can't learn that from examples. Um, so there's this idea uh, from Judea Pearl here at UCLA that's about the you know, causal inference. And basically almost all machine learning stuff, not all of it, but close to all of it, is, is taking a bunch of examples and it's trying to exploit statistical relationships, right? So, so you can imagine that like God told you the joint distribution. You don't need to learn the joint distribution from data. I just hand you the joint distribution. There's only certain kinds of questions you can answer, answer with the joint distribution. And you can't answer questions of these forms. Things like what would happen if I you know, turned off this, like if I knew the joint distribution for my simulator and then I ask what would happen if like the electricity failed in this part of it, I can't answer that question, right? I would need, I need a causal model. And then these kind of what would happen if I would have done something differently, these counterfactual questions. And these are really at the heart of doing science. And if you want to learn the underlying like laws of nature, you better be able to do these things. These are the kinds of things we can do all the time. Like I can slide my, 
you know, my, my uh, ruler across the floor, or I could slide it across the ice rink, and I, you, know, you know what's gonna happen because, you know, it's not because I collected data, it's because I have a causal model for what's going on. So here's just to put it very concretely, here's three very simple programs. They all have exactly the same joint distribution, uh, but uh, the way that the variables uh, x, y, and z are related to each other is different in terms of who's causing what. And if you go in there and for instance you intervene and at every step of the program you set x equal to three, uh, then, so then the output you're gonna have x equal to three, but the distribution of y is now going to be different in these three cases, okay? So the way that you can differentiate these three cases is by making interventions, okay? And in the simulator, you can do that, and you can potentially discover the causal model that's going on. And so, um, so this is like a, a step in this direction, you know, more and more machine learning research going in this direction. I think really if we ever want to make progress in that direction, causal inference has got to be like a, a first class citizen. Uh, and I'm not the only one, you know, saying this kind of stuff. So here's Yashua Bengio. Um, he's also saying, like, you know, if we knew the right causal structure, you know, the claim is that even for discriminative tasks, we'd be able to do much better, smaller sample complexity, you know, transfer learning, all these kinds of things, domain adaptations like systematic uncertainty again. And then you see, like, exchanges between, you know, Liam Bateau, Jan LeCun, Max Welling, you know, uh, Bernard Schulkopf, various Dan Roy. These are people that are all, you know, leaders in the machine learning thinking, and they're basically all saying, you know, yes, a lot of people have been making this point, and so, uh, but it hasn't really affected the, like the bulk of deep learning research, but I think that's kind of starting to change, and these physical simulators are like a really good playground, because you know, if you're trying to do it on health data, like, you know, you can't go in there and mess with people and their health records, like, you know, that's very difficult, right, and expensive, and ethics, and various things, but in a simulator of the universe, I can just do whatever I want, I can poke around and not feel bad about it. Um, here's another point, Peter Batiglia, who will be uh, at the program later for the interpretable machine learning, uh, you know, is just quoting various things about, uh, you know, about basically uh, from the point of view from human cognition, which is really like if you want to think about how did humans arrive at the formulas, like the laws of nature that we have, we did it, right? How did we do it? Like, you know, we, we c compose basic building blocks together. There's a lot of like composition, uh, compositional thinking and, uh, and this, you know, causality and various things like that. So I just want to kind of point to people that are moving in this direction. And then there's this point that I'd like to make here, which is like, once you have some insight of the data generating process, then you can design networks and things that take that into account, right? And so the, the machine learning term is often called inductive bias. So if example, you, you, these are experiments they did of like gravitational bodies moving around. There's like videos of this or balls bouncing off walls or like a, a string and chain like falling and hitting objects and things like that. So there are physical simulators and they show videos and then they say, can you learn this and then predict into the future? And uh, they can do pretty well, but then they also can do like, can you predict what would happen if I change the number of balls or change their masses, right? That's getting more into the direction of having like a, a causal model for what's going on. But the, the way they train it uh, partially is that their neural network structure has the idea that there's individual objects and they have pairwise connections, interactions, and they're learning, you know, they describe the data as a graph, and it's a graph neural network. There's this idea of geometric deep learning that's very related to this. So there's, this is like the inductive bias on the neural network architecture, and so here's their like form, formulation for graph networks, uh, and, uh, and that those have been very successful and we've used them in particle physics. But it's also kind of interesting, you've already kind of done, you know, in this problem, once you start saying that there's pairwise interactions, in some sense, you've done a lot of the hard, like if your goal was to learn the laws of nature, knowing that it's a bunch of pairwise interactions, you basically kind of almost solved the problem already. But that, I think that you shouldn't feel bad about that. I think we should take it one step at a time. I mean, one is to go from I tell you everything and I have a simulator to I throw away everything and I try to learn it from scratch. There's an intermediate part where I just say like, what if there's pairwise interactions and then I learn the force law, right? And like, you know, so I think there's all sorts of intermediate steps along the way uh, that, we can, that we can operate at. Um, there are examples for jets where, again, this kind of picture about how the causal model of how a jet evolves led to us thinking about neural network architectures instead of being 
you know, RNNs or big convolutional networks or something like that. This is the structure of the neural network. I use a physics algorithm to give me the architecture of the network. The architecture is based on trying to invert the causal process. And then the leaves are the data, and then it propagates up to the thing at the top, and I use it for doing a classification problem or a regression problem. So it's still a discriminative process, but the structure of the neural network uh, helps me a lot, and it performs well, and it also takes, uh, it has very, uh, you know, many fewer parameters. So, you know, some of these things have 1.5 million parameters. Ours has 34,000 parameters and works basically just as well with an error. So that's again like from the inductive bias, right? So, okay, so, um, and then you can then turn it around a little bit and say like, okay, instead of doing a discriminative thing, let me try to make a generative model for these jets. So this, I want to generate data that looks like this, and I'm now going to read it from top down. I'm going to start at the top with a few random numbers, and then I'm going to split into some more, and I'm going to go. It looks sort of like sequence generation for natural language processing, you know, where you're trying to make a translate a sentence from one language to another. Um, but it has a tree-like structure instead. Instead of being a sequence, it still has this autoregressive way of writing it. Um, it looks like a Markov process. It has all the right kind of physics features, but I don't know the actual distributions at each step. I need to learn that. And so uh, this group uh, by Schwartz and company uh, did that. And what was cool is that once they're done, the latent variables at each one of these nodes have some specific interpretation. It's like there was a particle that split into two other particles, and you can plot some things. So here's a plot of some, you know, that has to do with like the, you know, the fraction of the momenta for one of these particles compared to the other one or something, you know. Um, so here's some variable that has some physics meaning to it. Uh, the blue histogram is from the real physics simulator, and the red uh, curve is the model that was, the neural network model that was learned, but it's a causal generative model, and you can, and it's interpretable. You can go and probe the latent state and see what's going on. And this offers a path to be able to like systematically improve based on real data. So you might actually have a causal model, but it's not quite right, and then improve upon it you know, iteratively. If you could do that, that would be like, I think maybe even more important than trying to learn the physics from scratch, right? We already know a lot. We might as well just use it and then see if we can use deep learning to improve upon it, right? Okay, so this is uh, basically what I just said. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, I've got a couple of minutes, but the, uh, um, yeah, this last part is about interpretability. There's some slides here um, that had to do with this probabilistic programming. I will just say, just show you a video because it's fun. Um, so here's some code on the left, and what it's doing is it's saying randomly put down these green bumpers then drop some balls, let them bounce around, and do whatever they do, okay? And there's a physics engine inside that actually runs the deterministic stuff. So the only probabilistic stuff is where the bumpers are and like when you drop the balls and stuff. So there's, that describes a distribution over bumper placements and where you know, all the outcomes and everything, right? Now what I can do, what I'd like to be able to do is uh, see this little bucket here, is say what was the distribution, the posterior distribution of executions of this program given that you know, 20% of the balls land over here, right? If I could do that, it would be like, give me examples of executions of this program where 20% of the balls land here, and uh, in the space of all the programs, this is very like some corner somewhere, right? But I can ask that question. It's an interesting question, and here are some examples of them, and I could do a bunch of them, and that really describe get a distribution over not only the the, you know, the videos, but also like the stack traces inside the program, right? So if you wanted like interpretability, like this model, you know, is a causal generative model. It has all the kind of physics in it, right? And you want to do inference, and you want inference on the latent state, like it doesn't really get much better than this. You can go ask any kind of question you want. And uh, so this is under the realm of probabilistic programming. We've tried to scale it up. Um, part of how it works is basically that you hijack the random numbers in the simulator, and then you use neural networks to try to do some kind of fancy important sampling so that you sample this very large space efficiently. Uh, we try to scale it up to, instead of these like special purpose languages that were developed, so like normal C++ simulators and things that physicists actually use. And so here's like examples of collisions at the LHC uh, and uh, you know, what the, how the energy deposits are. And what we have is basically a PyTorch type layer that sits on the top. And then the actual simulator here, this is the stack trace, like stack traces of the program, like controls the random numbers, tries to make that, the, the simulator output your observed data. And, uh, but this is very heavy. So we're, this is in partnership with people at Berkeley on supercomputers. I'm just going to point to the code. 
Um, but you know, so this partnership we worked on in a couple of years, and the, it, we just released it, and we got nominated for best paper at supercomputing. And the reason I'm mentioning this is not to brag about that we got nominated for best paper, but this was a very simple toy problem, and it required like an enormous amount of infrastructure and supercomputers and all sorts of stuff and every trick that we knew. So, um, and this is where we already know the the model. Right? We're just trying to do inference in the model. Right? So if you're trying to learn the model ab initio and you don't know, like, I just think it's going to be very, very hard. Right? So it, I, I still dream that we'll get there, but I just want to kind of compare like, how hard it is even when you know what the model is. But once you have it, these are like illustrations of the posterior distribution, the prior and the posterior distribution of stack traces. And you can like, interpret what's going on inside the code. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I think, and then this is the last thing I'll say is that you know, why do we care about interpretability? This is like one of these debates about deep learning and interpretability, do we care or not? And you know, I think if you have some very fixed task that you care about, like uh, tell your automated car to drive you to the airport, you don't necessarily care about what's going on inside as long as you get to the airport on time and things work well. You know, that's one of the points that's made. And I think that that's kind of true, you know, depending on what you mean by good, as long as you can characterize it and it's robust and it suits your needs, maybe that's all you care about and it doesn't need to be interpretable. But if your task is science, um, why do we care in terms of science? Well, one of the reasons we care is that we don't just have this particular task we're trying to do. After we get done, you know, we're working in the scientific loop, right? And we need to be able to think about what's the next, next experiment I'm going to do? What are the kind of interventions I'm going to do for like, you know, counterfactual reasoning? Uh, what, uh, you know, how am I going to do all of this? And really, most of what I talked about today is really kind of in this blob. You gathered some data to test predictions, and now I've refined my hypothesis with the posterior, but all these other things about like hypothesis generation, et cetera, right now are mainly done by humans that have like a mental model for what's going on and it's causal and they use that to generate hypotheses. So if you, we want to replace machine, you know, the scientific pipeline with machine learning, unless you're in like a very closed, well-defined system, uh, you're going to need some more of this kind of stuff. So, um, and then there are some other points, but I'll stop. Okay. Okay. Thank you.